conceptual perspectives people talk Real about talk, it, it throwing shots. all of the elements. <laughs> Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Hope everybody's having a great start to your year. I'm going to try to get into this as rapidly as I possibly can because there's so much going on. Uh, that I need to be giving my attention to today. But um, you saw the intro, so you know that we are in the midst of a fundraiser. You know that what we do requires uh, resources. So we're challenging everybody who watches this video to go to the description box, click the link, and give. If you prefer, you can give through the organization's cash as a cash app account. That information is there as well. Uh, that's far as I'm going with that. You've seen... Uh, the intro, you know what we do. Show some love, show some support. I can't stress the need for that to happen enough. Now, someone that uh, I have a lot of respect for, uh, for a number of different reasons, uh, brought to my attention something that Dr. Robert uh, Malone uh, said uh, if you don't know who Dr. Malone is, Dr. Malone is the person who uh, many attribute to the uh, technology being used, the mRNA technology being used for the current uh, boost. So we're just going to call it that because I'm not trying to go there with YouTube. Uh, not right now. But anyway... He's the person, and he's been very vocal in an anti-poke, anti-boost uh, perspective. He has given a great deal of insight into his perspective, his idea, and he's been labeled a misinformationist. One of the top, they call him a star misinformationist. And whatever side of the argument you're on, I'm not here to make that argument right now. Uh, but here's what I will tell you is we got to be very careful uh, that we don't fall into messenger bonding or messenger rejection to the point that we miss truth or we get misguided. Uh, what I mean by that is you heard me say that. I don't get caught up with the messenger. I'm looking at the message. That way, when somebody that I'm not really feeling says something that's truth, I can receive the truth because I'm not associating it with the messenger. The messenger is just the deliverer of truth. And that messenger is more than likely going to have viewpoints that I don't agree with. So what that allows me to do is when I come across things that they say that I don't agree with, or I absolutely disdain, it doesn't change the truth that they deliver. I can receive the truth from anybody, but I can also say people who have delivered things or said things that I may have agreed with don't have a past to speak on things and not receive my ire when they're speaking on something they either don't know, it's outside of the area of their expertise, or they are speaking with the sole purpose of protecting their interests and not focusing on the truth. I don't think people really get 
how doing that impacts their credibility. I don't care how much of an expert you are. When people find out that you are saying things for the sole purpose of protecting something and you're not giving any consideration to the truth, they tend to start to think that what you're sharing in any area is not associated with the truth and has a specific agenda. And everybody has agendas. But let me tell you what Dr. Robert Malone did. Now, his area is bio... Uh, chemistry. His area is in the area of all the things that he's been talking about since this whole pandemic kicked off. Whatever side of the argument you want to land on, that's what his argument, that's his space. He was asking, I don't have a clue why somebody would think whether or not it was a good idea to ask him in the scope of him having some sense of professional expert in this area, but he was asked about reparations for uh, African Americans or the descendants of slaves and his response was, well, nobody today is picking cotton and I never owned any slaves. So no. And so Dr. Robert Malone, you get the smoke today because we're going to take a little look at history and the psychology of so socioeconomic castration, the pathway to uh, racial wealth inequity and how you do have a responsibility uh, in this country, and so does the government. It amazes me that people make these simple, superficial arguments about why no one should get reparations now and why they don't have a responsibility and why they feel like they shouldn't have to pay or their tax, do tax dollars shouldn't go towards reparations. Well, number one is if reparations are coming directly from the government, that's everybody's tax dollars. So the arrogance as if the only people paying taxes are white people is absolutely ludicrous. But to the idea of let's address the first thing, the first thing first, Robert Malone, uh, that you state is nobody's picking cotton and you never own slaves. So basically, because things have changed on the outside, look, looking looking at things, then that eliminates the culpability and responsibility to the point of where we are right now. Let me explain something to you, first and foremost. It's about what's owed. Let's go back to the beginning. At the end of the Civil War, the original uh, arrangement was that the U.S. government would give 40 acres of land and a mule to every freed slave, or every, free, every family. And uh, Lincoln shot, new president comes in, kills the deal. The, the understanding behind that first thing is that we have created a population of individuals who don't have the mechanisms to build a support system um, and, 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 and do all of that. So the first thing is we understand that we're owed that. We never got it. They changed it. Well, the very idea that they were willing to do it says they understood that when you take someone and you make them work uh, for 246 years with no pay, Forget the cat catastrophic injuries traumatically, emotionally, psychologically. You brought them from a country. You chained them to themselves. You put them in the hulls of ships for months at a time, or an average of three months before they could get here. They were on the sea that long uh, in disease-infested environments. They came here. They survived. Those that survived that were then sold off into slavery. Those that survived that had their names, their histories, their heritage, their faith systems, their spirituality all ripped from, from them and had new names and, and new ideas superimposed to them. They didn't have rights. They, could, they didn't have right to marry and have a family or hold anything other than what they were given to wear. Okay. Now, the psychological implications in that have been ironed out in several of my books. I don't want to go into much of that. Let's look at the financial elements of this. So then we come out of that. We don't get the thing we need to underwrite our ability to build our own wealth. Now, you keep in mind, you've had 246 years minimum of a head start as white people to build a head start in wealth. The wealth gap isn't because we're inferior or we don't understand. It's that you've had a head start. And anytime that we've tried to circumvent 
the barriers in front of us, you've come in and forcefully removed it. So let's look at how. Well, let's start with reconstruction. Everybody talks about reconstruction, but they do it with a glassed over um, way that that doesn't really look at what reconstruction really was and what it did and how we were impacted by it. Reconstruction of the 12 years immediately following the end of the Civil War. Well, what happened in that in the South is that after surrendering, the, the Confederate Army went back, turned in, surrendered. Their leaders were placed in prisons and um, the Union declared victory. They placed military installations around the South to keep peace. Here comes clandestine groups that we some are still in existence. Matter of fact, the, the Ku Klux Klan was one of the clandestine groups that rode through the South, burning down mis uh, military installations, shooting soldiers, uh, causing all kind of damage to the point that the North or the Union withdrew its troops and its installations and left the South to itself. Now, what the South did in those 12 years is reestablish the antebellum uh, environment in which it had existed prior to the Civil War, with one exception, slavery being an acceptable form, except for when an individual is incarcerated, because that's a part of the 13th Amendment, right? So here's what happens. Now, all the rights of blacks have been removed. So now they institute what we know now to be the Black Code. The Black Code say... Uh, you can't own land. You can't own. You can't own land. You can't uh, operate businesses. You cannot even take jobs in certain specific industries. And why was that necessary? Because blacks had the skills. They've been doing all the work for more than a couple of centuries. So they had the skill sets. They would have taken the jobs, and there was going to be a rise in need of jobs because watching black folks and overseeing black folks was no longer an, uh, a viable income because of emancipation. Okay, so that was one thing. Then came along convict leasing. It was huge. Why? Because it was convict leasing that put slaves back on the plant, or put blacks back on the plantation legally. How? They criminalized an unavoidable reality for blacks. You've been freed from the plantation you put out. You're not allowed to take jobs in most industries. You can't start your own business. You don't own land. That makes you a vagrant. You don't have a place to stay. You don't have a job. They criminalized vagrancy. They made it a felony. People were spending 12 years in prison for being vagrant, for being a vagrant. And then they turned around and leased them back to the very plantations they had been freed from, leased them to business owners at pennies on the dollars of what they would have been paid as freedmen. So again, you've got to understand that this thing is bigger than that. We, when we talk about slavery, we tend to talk about slavery as if black people were freed and everything was good. Everything was good. We were given an equal footing. We were given equal access. We were given free space and peace to live at peace and not be harassed, not be terrorized, that 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 everything went to good. We got all the um, therapy and treatment we needed for the trauma we have had experienced up until 1865. But no, that was reconstruction. After reconstruction, we went into convict leasing. Then we went into Jim Crow segregation. We went into redlining. We went into urban, uh, urban renewal, benign neglect. Over this course of these years, we're going all well. Look at what was going on. Look at Emmett Till in the 50s. Look at what went on that ignited the civil rights movement. Look at what took place after that. And then we still have not found equal footing. We still are at a point where even when we are able to achieve home ownership, our, home own, our homes are devalued solely by race. You got to understand that's what redlining was all about. The, in the 1920s and 30s, that's what redlining was about. It was about the fact that Having a black family, one black family in a predominantly white neighborhood brought the entire value of the neighborhood down. And that meant that we could not, uh, I mean, we could not get homes in places uh, where there was less crime, there was more affluent uh, opportunities and possibilities because we were being pushed out, we were being held out, we were being hated by any white family that was in that community. Why? It wasn't so much that every white person hated black people. It was because black people represented the, dev the, the devaluation of their property and their inability to access funds for businesses, for home renovations, uh, for cars, and for so many other things, solely based on that red line that outlined any community that had a black family in it. 
Now imagine communities with predominantly black families. What were they getting in the way of being able to finance, start businesses and fund things? And yet we still did. We had Tulsa, we had Slocum, Texas, we had Rosewood, we had Wilmington, Delaware. We had all of these places, enclaves, where we were building our own communities and in each and every opportunity, there was always some kind of uh, false narrative created for whites to come in and burn it down. We've never ever been compensated for the things we've experienced. And this is what reparations is. It's a repairing of damage done by, and it's not just financial damage. It's emotional damage, it's psychological damage, it's social damage. There are so many different things that we could unveil, that we could put pull back, that we could talk about. And then there's this idea, this notion, Robert Malone, where you sit up and you talk about, well, you know, why should the government have to pay for certain people becoming wealthy? Well, number one, if you have to ask that question, um, see, I, I find... I'm a person that finds it hard that a person that has a certain level of intelligence can't reason and rationale and think. It's when you when you do that, it tells me that you don't want to see the truth because the truth doesn't benefit you. And that that that's a problem to me. Because, but let me break it down for the people who are special and cannot get it and don't understand the basics of this. You know, well, why should the U.S. government pay for independent private wealth uh, accumulated through slavery? Probably because the U.S. government made it legal. We can start there. Maybe because the U.S. government had private contracts with a lot of these wealthy people. Maybe because a lot of these wealthy people held offices in U.S. senators and presidents and representatives and further uh, perpetuated the inequities that kept black people at bay and the wealth gap widening. Anytime you have something that is of statistical significance in science, and doctor, you know this, you are a physician, so you understand stand scientific research better than anybody that, uh, that, that, that that's probably going to watch this video. You understand statistical significance demands uh, explanation. What statistical significance is this? Anytime something happens or occurs at a level that cannot be explained by co coincidence, one to two, three percent on tops in most particular studies. You have to have an explanation for the occurrence. It's not just happenstance. There's a causality to it. There's a reason it happened. Well, when you have a collective group of people who are perpetually at the bottom end of the socioeconomic spectrum and the wealth gap is consistently widening, there has to be a causality for it. Well, it used to be that uh, the argument for black inferiority, you push that for a while until we start proving that we were pretty intellectually remarkable. And so then there had to be some other explanation. We are naturally criminal minded. We're starting to prove that that's an environmental creation, that you can take anybody and put them in certain situations and you're going to pretty much get the same results. You start to say that it's violence. Then we start to find out that 84% of white homicides are committed by white people. So there's no such thing as black on black crime if we're not going to acknowledge white on white crime. So we, we keep going into these, these caverns and realizing that Everything you throw up on the wall is, is, is refusing to stick now. So, so then what is the explanation? The explanation is that there are purposeful uh, mechanisms and machinations at play intentionally for the purpose of keeping uh, non-whites at bay. Now, the whole thing is, the truth is, it's about classism. Racism is simply the guard, guardian of the gate of classism. What are you saying? All of this is really created by the wealthy elite. White people just happen to be the beneficiaries of the privilege because of how the structure was set up. The people who became wealthy in this company happen to be white. So when they started to protect it, they started to use buffers that looked like them, gave them privilege, and created a white racial caste system that guarded their wealth. It's always about classism, elitism, and it just so happens that the people with the predominance of the wealth are white. So the people with the greatest privilege end up being white. And so we play this race game. But if you want to talk about reparations, reparations isn't a gift. It isn't some handout. It's what's owed. It was never paid. It's what got Dr. King killed. I talk about this all the time. 
It's long as Dr. King was talking about uh, the dream, talking about integration, talking about everybody getting along, you know, you know, little white boys and little white girls with little black boys and little black, all that stuff. He was great. They loved him. They, they championed him. Why? Because he kept black people emotionally distracted and focused on things that had no intrinsic value. Being liked by white people does not build wealth. Being accepted or allowed to patronize white people does not build wealth. What builds wealth is having access to resources and investing those resources within the collective to build the collective, to sustain the collective, to create autonomy within the collective so that we can stand on our own. But we were being exploited by every freaking group you can imagine. So the last thing we don't want is those at the bottom of the wrong to rise because everybody's standing on their back, not just white people. Arabs are standing on their back. Asians are standing on their back. Look in your freaking black communities and you'll find that your beauty supply stores, an industry, by the way, that 96% of the revenue comes from blacks is controlled by Asians. Your cleaners are predominantly controlled by Asians. Your gas stations, your liquor stores, Arabs, Middle Easterners. These are things we want to own. These are one things we want to control that we relinquished so that we could be liked. Here's the thing. Since the Civil Rights, Move, Civil Rights uh, Act was passed, we have had an e increased vote, black voter turnout every presidential cycle except for the year that Donald Trump won. Uh, and it wasn't our fault that he was elected. Don't buy into that bullshit. Uh, we'll talk about that some other time. But... Our turnout was the first, that was the first time it didn't increase. So for 50 plus years, it increases. And yet we haven't advanced an iota. And matter of fact, in many ways, we have actually regressed. We've gone backwards. We have not progressed in home ownership, still 41%. And even when we are able to own a home, it's not valued as the same as a comparable home owned by a non-black. But it's always taxed at a higher rate than non-blacks. Same comparable house that can't get the value for resale gets the value for taxes. You see these little subtle things are put in. These are the things we're talking about, Robert Malone. Stay in your lane. Because I can go on and on about this. I cover this in the first part of my book, The War on Black Wealth. I cover it in great detail in that book. From the black codes, own up convict leasing, own up uh, serial force displacement, all these things that have taken place that have kept us at bay, that have kept us from being able to gain a sense of footing and equity in the capacity to build. We're not saying give us all. We're saying give us what is owed to us based off of how you built. We don't have a world power without slavery. The advancement that we, the rapid growth and advancement in economic power was built on the backs of free labor. We're, we're going to pretend that didn't happen. So again, the U.S. government benefited from slavery beyond the private wealth sector. So we have to understand all of this. We have to understand it in a way that we don't allow that type of madness to be pushed. And I see a lot of black people pushing that. Now, does this excuse us from our own culpability and responsibility and how we handle what we do have? Absolutely not. We've got to do a better job of that. And I talk about that in uh, Wealth Building Wednesday and Money Mondays. But what I'm talking about now is the audacity for someone to get on and say that. And my problem is there's so many people that's going to give validity to it because he's taking a very strong stance on so many other things that we might agree with. We've got to learn how to separate the message from the messenger. We've got to learn how to hold everyone accountable. I'm no different. You know, there are people that are going to ride with me on my positions on 
uh, male masculinity, on my positions on homosexuality, my position on a bunch of things. And that doesn't mean that that when I go off and I may go to the left on something and you sit up and go, what the hell was that? That you sit up and say, well, it must be true. He said, no. You should always be able to question something. You should always be able to say, well, why does that make sense? Why is that supposed to be accepted as truth? Why should I take that as my position? Why should I say, and what I'm telling you is reparations is what's owed to us. Now, I am a firm believer as a black person that that can't be our saving grace, that waiting on them to handle a responsibility to us can't be what we're waiting on to raise ourselves out of the trenches of poverty. That's our responsibility. We have to take what we have. We have to learn how to move. We have to be able to understand how money works. We need to be able to understand how global markets work. We need to be able to understand how we create spaces in these markets that allow us to enrich ourselves and then use that enrichment to create wealth. That's something that we, we need to be responsible for. But Robert Malone, that's some pretty big bullshit you just shot. Uh, I would say I'm disappointed, but I don't have any expectations of anybody outside of myself and the people that I mentor and I teach and I love uh, on how they carry themselves because everybody's looking out for self around here. Um, everybody's looking for their own position and control and everybody's taking political positions that are popular among large groups. My positions aren't popular. My positions are based on truth and what's right. And so I'm not going to get a whole lot of follows. I'm not going to get a whole lot of likes. I'm not here for that. I'm here to empower people to uh, black people. I'm here to enrich people. I'm here to help people who aren't black, who want to do things, but I'm never going to put that before me and mine. There are good people out there. Matter of fact, there are some people that are out there that don't look like me that helped me when I was at my worst. Never asked for anything in return. Never mentioned it to anybody. So there are good people out there. I know how to judge individuals as individuals, but what I'm talking about is the system. And so with that being said, this is what I'm going to demand. I'm going to demand that we hold people accountable when they're saying things and they're speaking out that we don't just let it slide. And it's, and it's easy to sit up and say, man, you know what? I'm not getting involved with that. I know the truth. The problem is that's one of the biggest problems we have right now. The people who know the truth are quiet. The people who know the truth are just sitting there. Part of the reason we're tired. We fought for a long time and it seems like people just want to hear the lie. But I'm going to speak the truth as long as there, there's breath in my body. I'm going to speak the truth to the best of my ability on what I believe and what I think should be. I'm not going to sit around and just listen to lies. I'm not going out looking for them to have something to say. But when something that bold comes out and it impacts people and like a lot of people, just like the person who brought this to my attention, they have a they, they, they had a lot of respect for him because of the stance he had taken. Uh, we talk about virology and, and and dealing with viruses and and what he had what what he had put out in. And, and and so I get it, but everybody has to be held accountable for walking the space right. And on that note, look, I'm gonna get ready to get out of here. Again, as I said in the beginning of this, we are doing so much work. One of the ways we're doing it is in our research center. Another way is in our think tank, where we're coming up with solutions to the problems that we face on a regular basis. Others are in the programs we offer, like Black Men Lead, like our mental health program, like our program for intimate partner violence and domestic violence, like so much that we're doing. We need your support. This stuff doesn't happen just by happenstance. It doesn't come free. And we've been doing it for decades. This isn't new. Look back. I've been doing this for a while. This isn't my first channel. Uh, I've gone to bat with YouTube a couple of times. I've been doing this a while. Uh, I mean, long before social media was social media, I've been doing this. And now I'm saying, hey, come along and help us do what we're doing so that we can start to level the playing field through strategy, through resource, through development, through preparation, through empowerment. On that note, look, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day.